There are a lot of tools in a filmmaker's toolbox in order to get us to understand what's going on inside a character and what's going on in the movie, period. One of the key tools is actually the voiceover narrator, and it works something like this. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. What in the world was that voice? You've seen this technique in a lot of movies. Let's talk about what the voiceover narrator is, what it's for, when to use it, and when maybe not to use it, coming up next. <laughs> to me, a voiceover narrator is a holdover from earlier kinds of artworks that influenced movies. Say, for example, a first-person narrator from a novel, for example. Hold it, hold it. What is this? Are you trying to trick me? Voiceover is in a type of sound where only the listener or viewer can hear the voiceover. It's actually called technically a non-diegetic sound. What does that mean? It simply means that the characters inside the movie or nobody inside the movie can hear it. It's a sound only you can hear. It is well to dream of glorious war in a snug armchair at home. But it is a very different thing to see it firsthand. Now, there are basic reasons to use voiceover. One would be dubbing, for example, where a microphone didn't quite catch audio correctly on a set. Or, say, in a cartoon, a voiceover actor brings a cartoon character to life and gives that character a voice. What I want to focus on in this video is actually voiceover narrators who are added into a movie who may or may not have to be there. In fact, it was a choice on the part of the movie makers, maybe the director or screenwriter, or both, to insert a voiceover narrator for a lot of different purposes. Of course, one thing a voiceover narrator can do, like a first-person narrator in a novel, is to give us the internal voice of a character, or maybe several characters, if there are several voiceover narrators. I was thinking about that dame upstairs and the way she had looked at me. And I wanted to see her again, close without that silly staircase between us. That means that the voiceover narrator as a tool can help overcome a technical and formal problem that movies have, which is to get us into a character, into their interior world, their mind, their thoughts, their desires, and figure out what they're saying to themselves on the inside. You know, in books, you can easily access that through any kind of narrator, not just first person, but even third person, which can zoom inside a character and say he or she was feeling or thinking a certain kind of thing. But movies have a very difficult time with that. And one easy way to deal with that in movies is to have a voiceover narrator say, this is what this character feels, this is what this character thinks. The life of a playwright is tough. It's not easy as some people seem to think. In that way, the voiceover narrator can provide key information to an audience. You know, script writers especially are always looking for ways to, you know, not to have exposition, but to give information to an audience in interesting or complex ways. And a voiceover narrator might be able to do that, telling you information that the character knows, but may not be telling everybody else or is already assumed by everything else. Say background information in a movie, for example. I was conceived in the Riviera, not the French Riviera the Detroit variety. The way it ends up working for a viewer in terms of our experience is that the voiceover narrator is a disembodied voice layered over the top of the visuals and the diegetic sounds, which are the sounds that come within the frame that the characters can hear. Now, one of the main problems with voiceover narrators is that they are redundant. In fact, a lot of script writers aren't really aware that what they're doing is when the movie is filmed, that then the visuals are saying the same thing or nearly the same thing as the voiceover narrator. This was work and more work and a routine that took up every daylight hour. In Hatfield, we had done pretty much what we pleased. Here, things were different. Another problem with voiceovers is that they stand out and they are a very dominant sort of texture in a film. When we hear a voiceover narrator, given everything else going on in the movie, the visuals, the cutting, the style, the colors, and the other sounds, the voiceover narrator tends to dominate. We listen to that narrator first, perhaps, before we pay attention to any of those other things, because we want to know the information being told to us, or sort of the contents of the story. New client. Recreational they don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. Ex-cop. Ex-blade runner. Ex-killer. One of the most famous examples of this, I think, is from the 1982 movie Blade Runner, 
which has a you know long sort of film history thing going on in it, in which Harrison Ford was forced by the movie studio to go in and record voiceovers that were then layered over the top of Ridley Scott's original cut from the movie. If you watch that movie in the original theatrical release with the voiceover, you can just tell that it's way too much, it's over the top, and it is overbearing. The visuals and the sound in that movie are immaculate. Very highly praised movie Blade Runner is, but yet that voiceover tends to dominate all those other elements, and so we sort of lose their punch and their you know awesomeness at the expense of paying too much attention to the voiceover narrator. I don't know why he saved my life. Maybe in those last moments he loved life more than he ever had before. And of course, in the famous scene, one of the most quoted lines in movies is when the character of the android Roy Batty dies. And you have the reaction to that from the Rick Deckard character. And in the theatrical release, it's a voiceover narrator and it just sort of explodes or destroys all of the emotion around Roy Batty's death. But when the in the director's cuts and subsequent cuts, you don't have that voiceover narrator. It's a very different feel as far as that famous death scene goes. And not to throw this movie completely under the bus, but a lot of people love the movie Ad Astra when it came out, and it does have some great visuals in it, but I was really bothered by the voiceover narrator who was saying both very basic and plain and unpoetic things. It's too much of a memoir, self-reflective kind of voiceover narrator, and that voiceover narrator does, is redundant at times. I must accept the fact I never really knew you being pulled down the same dark hole. However, there are great reasons to use voiceover narrators and not just for some kind of expository information dump. They really can give you insight into the internal state of a character and unique internal insight, especially if you have an intriguing character, intriguing character voice. They told everybody they were brother and sister. My brother didn't want nobody to know. You know how people are. You tell them something, they start talking. I think a good one comes from Terrence Malick's Days of Heaven, in which the voiceover narrator, I think unexpectedly, is a young girl who is perceiving her world certainly differently than we do as a viewer. We see far more than she does, and because she's immature, we get her perspective on things. It's unique and different, and she doesn't sort of see what we see as, as far as sort of the shadier, seedier things going on. And it's a really interesting sort of character study in her, just to think about what's going on in her voiceover. There must be a con like me in every prison in America. I'm the guy who can get it for you. Cigarettes, a bag of reefer, if that's your thing. One of the most famous voiceovers probably ever is Shawshank Redemption, still the number one movie on IMDb.com. But the voiceover narrator, voiced by Morgan Freeman, who went on to become you know, the most famous voiceover actor ever, probably. And in that movie, you get a lot of him, of his character Red, commenting on not just himself, but in particular the main character, Andy Dufresne, played by Tim Robbins. And while I think some of the voiceover, maybe 20% or so, is unnecessary in Shawshank Redemption, you get this sort of other look at Andy Dufresne from a particular perspective that's not just the camera, but it's this unique character who it turns out to be Andy's very good friend. And that sort of other perspective adds another layer, or multiple perspectives then, on the main character. Andy kept pretty much to himself at first. I guess he had a lot on his mind trying to adapt to life on the inside. And of course that Morgan Freeman character is a smooth and interesting and, and nice to listen to voice. There are intriguing voices in terms of sound, there are intriguing voices in terms of writing. And I think one of the better ones, and there's a lot of voiceover in this movie, is Goodfellas. If we wanted something, we just took it. If anyone complained twice, they got hit so bad, believe me, they never complained again. The Ray Liotta character really dominates in terms of voiceover. His wife is even a voiceover narrator. There's multiple ones in that movie, but he talks over the movie the entire time. One of the reasons I think it really works is it's just interesting and colorful. 
And Martin Scorsese, who is a vast reader of all kinds of books and literature, knows what a voiceover narrator can do because he's seen and read so many first-person narrations, and he loves them and he honors them. So I think in this movie in particular, you're going to get a more interesting narrator than, say, the others that I've mentioned that aren't so good. This is the day. This is the day, the last time I shall drive up to these gates. These iron bars that keep the man I love locked away from me. Then you get to the unreliable narrator, and if you want to talk about multiple perspectives, we see the movie, we hear the movie, but then if a narrator who we can't trust comes in and tells us what to think or gives us an alternate perspective, then we're sort of playing a game of whether how much we can trust an unreliable narrator, how much that narrator is lying. And typically that comes from a character who is you know, guilty in some way or may be guilty. Film noir, classic film noir narrators, really do great at this. One movie I can think of is Raw Deal, which is narrated by the female who may or may not be a femme fatale. Way out west there was this fella, fella I want to tell you about. Fella by the name of Jeff Lebowski. At least that was a handle his loving parents gave him. And in terms of novel or interesting or complex interpreters, you may have a narrator who is outside the film watching events. Say, for example, most famously perhaps in The Big Lebowski, the, the cowboy character played by Sam Elliott. What in the world is this voice? Where does it come from? Does it make Big Lebowski a Western? And of course, that character ends up appearing at the end of the movie. He's a voiceover for a little bit of it, but then at the end, there he is. And so what is this perspective through which we see the Big Lebowski? Who is this person? What does it mean for this character to be a cowboy or a, a Westerner in a movie that's really about Southern California dudes and is sort of a detective story in, in its own weird way? Then there's other sort of voiceover that is very different, say Terrence Malick's, a mass consciousness voiceover narrator. In fact, many voiceovers in, say, his movie, The Thin Red Line. Who are you living all these many forms? That movie famously has the actor speaking voiceover, but it's hard to tell who's speaking and when, and viewers misinterpret which narrators are talking and when. It's not that we the person we see on screen is necessarily the narrator. And you get about five to ten characters becoming voiceover narrators, and you get this sort of mass consciousness or oversoul feel from some of these mass narrators. It's a really interesting effect in The Thin Red Line. For all these reasons, I think the voiceover narrator can be really effective, but a scriptwriter in particular has got to know literature really well. First person narrators in particular in all kinds of books, detective stories, classic Victorian literature, modernistic literature, you gotta be well aware of what a first person narrator can do, for example. And then the director has gotta make some key decisions about whether that voiceover narrator after the fact is worth putting in in post-production, let's say. As I said, my advice is cut it because most of the time it's unnecessary, but when it works, it's gonna be really, really neat. What do you think are good movies with voiceover narrators? What movies are ruined or harmed by voiceover narrators? Let's make a list down in the comments. Let's see what you all have to say about my choices for examples. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to this channel for more great content. Have a great day.